Thanks for tuning in to That's What I Call Marketing, the CAN Sessions. Brought to you by Friedman International, the international campaign experts taking the pain out of your multi-market campaigns. I'm your host, Connor Byrne, and having worked with Friedman International in my previous role as a global marketing leader, I've experienced firsthand their deep level of expertise and attention to detail as the go-to experts for all international campaign needs. Now, let's get right into today's episode of That's What I Call Marketing, The Can Sessions. Welcome to That's What I Call Marketing, The Can Sessions, brought to you by Friedman International. Of course, this is the podcast where you'll hear from the leading lights in the marketing world and listen to their unique insights. Don't forget, please do rate or review this episode wherever you're listening or watching. It really helps us reach and build on this amazing community of engaged marketers just like you. And if you're interested in getting involved with That's What I Call Marketing, our sponsorship kit is now available on our website. That's what I call marketing.com forward slash sponsor. On to today's episode. And in today's episode, I meet Chidi Akara, who's the Chief Product Officer of HUGE. We're going to delve into his journey in the advertising and marketing world. We reflect on the foundational years where he worked at the likes of Gray, BBH. He learned valuable lessons about strategic thinking, creative storytelling, and relationship management. And these skills were put into use while managing the Levi's account globally and creating the establishment of BBH New York. We cover Chitty's shift to client side with Nike, where he led a creative team to relaunch the iconic Cole Han brand and also discuss his time at Simon. This background culminated in Chitty landing into his current role as Chief Product Officer at Huge, where he focused on integrating AI and technology to create intelligent experiences that are highly personalized and conversational. We touch on maintaining client relationships, the shift towards outcome-based agency models and the critical role of visionary leadership and also touch on Chitty's involvement with an organisation that I've been a huge fan for a long time, Charity Water. And we discuss how transparency and technology and impactful communications in the nonprofit sector really make a difference. Throughout our discussion today, themes of innovation, relationships, future of marketing are explored and it really is a must-listen episode for anyone who's interested in the evolving landscape of advertising and technology with a fascinating, really engaging, interesting guest, Chidi Akara. Yeah, I'll give you a nice branding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I like that. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me on That's What I Call Marketing. It's uh, great, to, great to meet you here, Can. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Connor. Nice to get out of the heat for a few minutes. Abs- and absolutely. In yeah. the salubrious surrounds. Enjoy the, exactly. Enjoy the luxury of the Carlton. Why not? <laughs> All good. Um, well, listen, I'd love to, for people who may not know you, um, talk a bit about maybe your, your, your background. I was reading that you had worked, you spent time at Grey and BBH, incredible places to work. Um, I'd love, like, you reflect about that time in those agencies. What were the kind of things you were working on and kind of what's your, your fond memories, I guess, of those places? Yeah, so I think, you know, that was the first phase of my career. You know, I came out, of, came out of university. I was desperate to work in advertising. It sort of captured my imagination. I always wanted to work at BBH. Um, I started off at Gray, which was a great training ground at the time. Uh, and, you know, eventually tra- transitioned to BBH about 18 months later. And I think it really, you know, it helped me learn at a very early stage. I think the, cr- the three key components of success in our business... Um, one is the ability to think strategically. The other is to understand the power of creative ideas and storytelling. And then the third component is the ability to sort of manage relationships both internally and also with clients. And, you know, often you'll find people are really good at one or two of those. Yeah, but I yeah. think, you know, what I learned from um, some of the master operators at BBH was the importance of being able to combine all three. Uh, And my key area of responsibility was running the Levi's account for many years and running that internationally. So globally outside of the U.S. at the time and then worked to help BBH win the U.S. business um, and and was a part of the sort of early team that was planting the seeds of opening up BBH New York back in the day. And that was a really exciting time because it was one of the first times that a U.K. based agency had the global business from a U.S. based, you know, iconic yeah. brand like Levi's. Uh, so those were those were good times. But I think it was just a, a fantastic sort of like combination of like a university and a boot camp. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, sort of baptism of fire, but learning from some of the best. And I, so much of what I learned in the first four to five years of my career 
have been completely foundational to the way that I think and operate and lead now. Wow. And yeah. um, can I ask you to call the mic a little bit closer? Oh yeah, just sorry. to be sure. Sorry. And yes. um, the just fascinated. I'm always interested because I think people like when I meet people through the marketing podcast mm. that there's either people who kind of have fallen into marketing or like you were obsessed and wanted to, to get into it. Was there a moment where you were like, I don't know, like people said, actually a friend of mine saw a Levi's ad and he was like, that's why I want to be in advertising. Was there a moment like that for you? Yeah, there was actually. It was, it was um, a very long time ago. Uh, <laughs> I just happened to be watching TV one night uh, with a couple of friends and there was a show um, and it was basically an, an interview with John Hegarty, who okay. at the time I didn't know who he was and I didn't know who BBH was. But um, I can't remember the exact name of the show, but he was showing sort of examples of their work and talking about how they created these ads. And it was incredible ads for things like Levi's that you mentioned, uh, for Audi and others. And I was sitting there with my mates and I was like, oh my God, you know, when we were in college, th these were the ads that we actually loved, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, there was, was that old saying back in the UK that the adverts were better than the telly. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, here people talk about, oh, when the ads come on, they go and, you know, you know grab a beer or whatever. It was the opposite. It's yeah. like, you did that when the TV came on. When the adverts were on, you were, like, transfixed. Uh, and so that was literally my sort of epiphany light bulb moment was seeing John, who I'm actually going to see this week in Cannes, oh, wow. which is really exciting, like many, many years ago, and who's always been a mentor and inspiration for me, seeing him talk through that work and realizing that it wasn't just advertising, it was culture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was defining the look and the feel and the storytelling of culture. This is what people were talking about, you know, in pubs and parties. Did you see that new Levi's ad? Did you see that Audi? Oh, it's so cool. Like, it was, it became a part of the cultural vernacular in a yeah. way that uh, was extremely exciting to be a part of creating work that you knew that people around you were going to be discussing and impacted by. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's so yeah. exciting. Isn't yeah, it, it was like, amazing. It was yeah. an amazing time. Yeah. yeah. I know it was different because, you know, there was less things for people yeah. to look at. But you went then, am I right, you went on to Nike after that? Yeah, my first, my first move on to the client side was uh, at Nike Inc. Um, and I ran a creative team that was responsible for relaunching one of their brands um, called Cole Haan, which is an iconic shoe brand in the, U yeah. in the U.S. A bit like Clarks or churches in the, in, in the U.S. to degree. Uh, sorry, in the U.K. to degree. Uh, and that was really fascinating. That was a really interesting... Um, moment. I'd worked very briefly for BBH in New York uh, and, and we were working on Cole Haan and I transitioned in-house. Uh, and what they identified at the time was that it was sort of like the type of brand that everybody had connected with or had an interaction with at some point. Okay. Right? Like at some point, you know, whether it's your parents or grandparents or whatever, but that was part of the problem was that the average age of the, of the user was like, or the buyer was like 48 years old. Right, okay. So they were essentially left. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, once people sort of hit that age and into their 50s and 60s, they don't really buy a lot of new yeah. stuff. So we had to kind of reposition it for a younger generation. So that was really the ch challenge at hand for us was like, how do we take the DNA of these extremely well-made shoes that now, because they were owned by Nike, had Nike Air injected into the sole. So they kind of had this sort of kinetic comfort dynamism about them. Right. But they still on the on the top, you know, they could look as they could, they could, you could walk into a business meeting or into like, you know, a party or dinner or whatever. So there was this kind of day to night, 24 seven thing. So that was really interesting experience looking at relaunching a brand from the inside with the resources and insight and support of, you know, an incredible uh, organization like Nike. Uh, and that got me a little bit of a taste um, for working in-house and was, building in-house yeah. creative teams and in-house digital product and digital marketing teams, which I did for about 10 years. I was going to ask how that kind of how that felt, because it is very different working in agency to to in-house. Did you did you kind of start to understand things that might have frustrated you when you're at an agency? You know, like, what's the client doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's a great question, because, you know, what I realized was. At the time, I don't think, and this is a vast generalization, but I don't think that client agency relationships were necessarily at their most constructive at the time. Okay. You know, it was like digital and social were accelerating. A lot of the agencies were kind of, you know, really kind of challenged uh, to kind of understand that new terrain and help clients navigate it. Um, and so what I realized actually that for me, it was much more expedient for me to build internal creative teams. So it was, the, okay. it was sort of like the beginning of that in-house agency wave. Yeah. Um, and what I liked about running in-house teams was that you could move 
incredibly quickly because you didn't have that tension, yeah. sort of us and them, that you sometimes yeah, yeah. find between agencies and clients. But that, you know, I admit that that dynamic tension can be very creative and very constructive. Uh, but particularly in retail, you just need to move fast. It's right. like, you know, shoes were down this weekend, handbags were down, or, you know, T-shirts were up, like, we're going to get all over it. So it's like okay. Tuesday, you, you know, you're sort yeah, of like... Yeah having a brainstorming and you need to launch a new campaign that weekend, that's sometimes hard to do when you're working with certain types of agencies. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I did enjoy the kind of speed and the velocity and the control that we had from working in-house. But I think what you miss is a sort of more broad global insights, if you like, that an agency can bring because yeah. they're working with so many, so many different yeah. clients and so many different categories. Yeah. They're seeing so many trends and patterns uh, and developing those insights that could be valuable for your business. So, you know, there's pros and cons of either approach, to be honest. It's like everything in marketing. It's not either or, is it? Yeah, like, exactly, you know what I mean? Like, exactly. there's no one answer to no, it. No, totally. Um, you can bo do both ways successfully. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of actually in-house teams will use agencies probably for that reason yeah. as well, because yeah, yeah. you get that wider thinking, but they use them for different things, maybe when they don't need to move as fast, you know, the, you know kind of the bigger briefs or, or, or yeah. that kind of thing. No, I mean, absolutely. And, and I joke often with my at my uh, newish colleagues, it's huge. There was a time when I was looking at doing a digital experience uh, project and I reached out to a bunch of different agencies. And the usual suspects, you know, yeah. this was like seven or eight years ago, whoever were the leaders at the time, I don't need to call them out by name, <laughs> but uh, huge were too busy to kind of like even meet with me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you know, the, the business was definitely booming and they were, you know, I think at some point they, they said they were working with like 50% of the Fortune 100 companies. So it was like, a, it was an incredible time for huge. Um, but that, to your point, that was the type of expertise yeah. that we were not able to develop in house. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, an agency like Huge would have been hugely useful for us, or, or, or you know, a similar type of agency. Um, I'm going to get on to Huge in just one minute, but yeah. you had then a, a, another role working in retail again. Um, yeah, kind of for Simon. Yeah. yeah, and that was like international, wasn't it? As well, they're in a lot yeah. of different different exactly. countries. Um, I'd love to talk. I'm fascinated. I was saying to you before, you know, I worked in an international role, yeah. lots of different markets, and there's lots of challenges with that. Mm -hmm. Trying to f trying to figure out what are the things we need to do differently but what are things we can do that are the same and that can scale yep. i'd love to get your take on and your experience at simon kind of with that international remit yeah no, i mean so when i joined simon and for those who don't know simon it's a very it's the world's largest retail real estate group so they own shopping malls uh, around the world so when i joined there was about 320 shopping centers around the world that they owned um north america throughout north america including mexico but also japan uh, Korea, Indonesia, um, Malaysia, I believe, a couple of other countries. And um, it, was, it was a really interesting time because what they identified was that they had a world-class business that was incredibly successful and growing and, and very reputable. Like they were considered gold standard in that world. I mean, Westfield was probably the closest um, competitor internationally, but they hadn't really invested in their brand. Right. And they felt that, and we felt, as I was you know, talking to them, that we were leaving a lot of value on the table when it came not just to like shoppers, but also the brands that we wanted to have in the centers, the retailers, uh, the media and PR, uh, and also um, investors um, and Wall Street. There was a lot, of, a lot of money that was being left on the table because we hadn't invested in building this world-class brand that could A, reflect the value of the business, but also accelerate growth. Okay. Um, and so it was, how do we take the essence of what we bring to the market for a range of different constituents and audiences, some of which I've just mentioned, in a way that is, that is unified globally, but also as a brand system and a design identity has enough flexibility to accommodate some of the nuances yeah. of the individual markets, right? So particularly markets like, like Japan, yes. which is, a, yeah. <laughs> I know you have experience in yeah. Japan. There's a very... Um, is a very, should I say, established set of conventions around marketing and advertising in, in that particular market. You know, and it's a strong market. Yeah. Uh, it's slightly different in Korea. Uh, and there were certain markets where we could essentially just export what we did in the US or North America. And then certain markets where we had to like really find this balance, this nuanced balance between what would work in the US and what would work in that particular market. I mean, this, this is these sort of issues that global marketers and advertisers have been grappling yeah. with for decades. So it, it's, it's nothing new. But, you know, I think what was very interesting about that time was it wasn't just, you know, a bunch of ad campaigns. We invested very heavily in digitizing the business. So... 
Um, our websites were incredibly important. So, so we relaunched every center had its own website, plus there were global websites. So we're talking about relaunching sort of 300 plus websites. Uh, we built a bunch of different apps, you know, the shopping app, parking apps, cinema apps, food apps. So the idea was that if you could remove the friction using digital uh, and physical channels to get people into the centers, spending more time, increasing dwell time, um, that for every minute that they spent in the center, extra minute, it was an extra dollar. Wow. Which doesn't sound like a lot of money, but a when you have 100 million people, yeah. visitors a year, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, it, it adds up to, to, to proper money. Um, and so that was a, really what we were trying to do, was to, to, was to sort of elevate the overall experience around the world, increase dwell time, and also attract a new generation of brands that people didn't typically expect to see in a mall. So things like, you know, brands like Warby Parker or Harry's you know, Razors, or, you know, at the time it was brands that were super hot, like Casper Mattresses and Peloton, et cetera, Tesla. Um, I think there's about 50 Apple stores and Simon Centers. So those were the real kind of like traffic drivers yeah, to, yeah. For, the, for the younger generation of shoppers, right? So uh, it was an incredibly exciting time, learned a lot, worked with some great people. I'm very, I get like if you think like very, very different from you know the gray BBH days, yeah. totally different thing. And then, as you say, recently um, moved to to huge. Tell me a bit about kind of how that that came about. Yeah, well, actually, in between huge. Oh, yeah, I missed the step. <laughs> and no, 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 it's all good because it because it because it'll make more sense for you know the reason why I moved to huge. But um, between Simon and Huge, uh, I spent uh, a number of years working in tech startup world. Okay. So that, again, so I would say that my career sort of had three chunks, yeah. right, prior to Huge. It was, cla you know, cl sort of more traditional creative agencies we discussed. Then it was in-house on the client side, and then it was startup side. Um, and that's where I really fell in love with the nuts and bolts of building digital products. Um, you know, understanding, you know, sort of uh, product strategy, UX, research, um, development, engineering, et cetera. Uh, bringing all of those different disciplines around the table. I worked at a larger startup, uh, sort of, I don't even think you can call it a startup now, but it's more, it's still a, a VC backed company, an investing app called Stash. And then more recently, um, I was working at a, an AI startup called Brain AI, okay. uh, which was one of the pioneers of generative interfaces. Um, really interesting, cutting edge work in that field. Uh, much smaller than someone like OpenAI, but actually working uh, with similar technologies. And that's what led me to Huge okay. because it was almost like a culmination of so many different things that I'd done, working on the agency side, um, being able to work with world-class brands, but also injecting new emerging technologies into building these amazing digital experiences. Perfect storm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope so. <laughs> and so your chief product officer at Huge, you know, probably quite a broad and big question to ask, what are you focusing on? But what are you focusing on? Yeah. No, it's a good question. So... <laughs> So my remit, we've, always, we've had a chief product officer role for a while, but it's retooled um, since my arrival. So effectively, you know, for those who don't, aren't super familiar with Huge, we're a design and innovation company, and we create digital products and experiences uh, for a number of world-class brands. Um, and Google's our biggest client. We've been working with Google for over 10 years, and we've probably built like, you know, 100 plus different projects for them. Uh, so the CPO's role really is, is to oversee our, our key teams, which are the creative and design teams, so the folks who actually design these experiences, and also the tech team who you know help build the right. experiences, uh, as well as re a real heavy focus on introducing new technologies, particularly AI, and making sure that internally we're retooled, that we have the right tooling that we need to build the next generation of what we call intelligent experiences. So those are experiences that are built with AI, but also our AI experiences that we're creating for our clients um, in order to drive, you know, more engagement uh, for their experiences. Can you give me an example of what an intelligent experience yeah. is, just kind of to, to bring it to life? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'll just step back for a second and just think and just speak a little bit more philosophically about, about what we mean by that. And then, you know, our point of view is that the future of digital is going to be in highly personalized and, and intelligent. And by that, we mean that emerging technologies like AI will enable us to create experiences, digital experiences that feel increasingly conversational, human-like, contextual. Um, and so examples of that are, you know, A, using AI tools 
to automate certain aspects of the creative and development process okay. in ways that haven't been done before. So it's like how we build, but also what we build. So, you know, at the moment, let's, let's, just, let's just, you know, sort of pull the thread a little bit on, on conversational interfaces. You know, at the moment, a conversational interface is typically considered to be like a chatbot sitting in the bottom right of a yeah. screen, right? Yeah. And you ask them questions. And, you know, we've had chatbots for a long time and with varying degrees of accuracy or, <laughs> yeah. or frustration or, or, <laughs> frustration or sophistication, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but how do we think beyond that? How do we think about instead of having a more static digital experience where you're pressing a bunch of buttons and everybody's pressing the same buttons and getting the same outputs? How can you create experiences that are highly personalized, customizable, and contextual for the actual user? So the example that I always give is like, you know, if you go onto, you know, let's say a, 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 search, a search site uh, and you're trying to find a vacation in Hawaii, the search site will know what you want based on the buttons that you're clicking, but it will not know your intent. It won't okay. know why you want to go to Hawaii. Do you okay. want to go to Hawaii because you want to celebrate an anniversary, because yes. you're burnt yeah, out yeah. and you want to get away from everything, because you're a nature lover? But if you start with a sort of conversation, almost like going back to the old days where you would sit in front of a travel agent yes. yeah, and they yeah, would ask yeah. you a bunch of questions and then they would sort of craft an itinerary that was based upon your needs and your wants, why can't we do that in the digital space? You know, What we've done is we've gone from like that human interaction um, which was very, very labor intensive and sort of, you know, costly yeah. in terms of time, right? You had to go to a place and sit down and take an hour or whatever. And then we sort of like um, standardized it across a bunch of different digital experiences where you could tap buttons and it would, you know, put together a trip for you, but wouldn't really know exactly why you were taking the trip. How could, essentially what we're talking about the intelligent experiences is to combine the two. Right. All right. So that becomes uh, intent aware software that actually understands what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it, and can get you to your destination or to your, your request and your need uh, in a much more efficient and effective way. And isn't that, because I just love that, because um, when we talk about AI and technology, there is there's some fear definitely yeah. about yeah. it. But that's such a wonderful example of how you kind of almost bring humanity back yeah. into an experience for somebody, you know, that we've lost a bit because we went to, What's the way we can scale yeah, and exactly. add, you know, the response to this question as fast as possible? But actually getting something that means and is more meaningful to somebody um, is really, really exciting. Yeah, no, I think, I, think, uh, I think, you know, I totally understand the concerns and the fears about AI on multiple different levels. Um, but I think there is so much potential to create experiences that are very uplifting and enrich enriching, right? I think it's the question of how we deploy mm -hmm. AI. And I think as marketers, we don't want to do it in ways that feel stunty or gimmicky. We have to do it in ways that actually are meaningful, yeah. that sort of elevate the experience, that ultimately we want to drive um, deeper connectivity with consumers, with people, in everyday people, uh, and be able to meet their needs more efficiently and effectively. Yeah. Yeah. And like, again, it's great for brands because brands are actually able to scale that human interaction and emotional connection with people, you know, because yeah. scale is something that, you know, all brands, we look for, right? You look for how do we do this? How do we do it at scale? Because it's expensive to do things in that one to one. Um, I, I was reading a bit about um, the, the culture decoder and creative capital index tools. Um, can you tell me a bit about the, a bit about them? I was fascinated when I was reading, but I was like, I need to find out more. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting, um, and this obviously a lot of this predates me, but we're doubling down on on some of these AI investments. Huge started building out an AI powered data lake um, probably three years ago, uh, and it's a it's essentially a data lake that ingests about 110 different data reports every month, and so it has over a billion data touch points. Right. And that's across um, business intelligence, brand and marketing intelligence, digital behaviors, social media, news reviews, et cetera. Uh, and that data lake is the foundation upon which these marketing applications are built. So um, Cultural Decoder and CCI. Cultural Decoder is essentially real-time insights into trends, consumer trends, and how they're impacting brands. Okay. So, for instance, you know, one of the clients that we work with is, is Jeep. Um, and there is this uh, phenomenon in America over the last few years, I think it started during COVID, where it's, it, sounds, it sounds crazy, but it's true, where <laughs> Jeep drivers, for some reason, put rubber ducks on each other's cars. It's what? like a symbol of unity, right? <laughs> 
And it's really? like, yeah, it's like a thing. That's brilliant. It's a thing. And then, so people start collecting these rubber ducks. They, they, <laughs> they call it ducking people. And so you'll see the people that are walking, driving around the States with the, on the dashboard, they have like six or seven different, different rubber ducks, right? Like that's, like, that's the sort of behavior that we can pick up on in yeah. real time. And then, I mean, I'm just using that as an example. Like, obviously, you would say to a brand like Jeep, you want to lean into that and embrace mm. that, right? That is grassroots community love for your brand. Yeah that is so much more powerful than any ad campaign, how can you fan that flame, yeah, right? Yeah, how can yeah. you amplify yeah. that? So those, and then, but there's other trends that might percolate up through um, Culture Dakota that you may say, okay, you know what, that's a trend, but we're not gonna touch it right now uh, because it's not right for us, right? But the idea is that you know what consumers are thinking, doing, and how they're behaving in real time um, through this aggregation of different sources, you and then that into, intelligence can I be used by brands um, strategically to decide whether they want to deploy a particular, you know, activation, or they want to lean into it, or whether they just want to monitor it, or whether they actually want to stay away from it. Yeah. Um, so that's CD. So CCI is a different type of application. It essentially measures a business strengths or weaknesses across brand offerings and experience. And what I think is really important about this is in, in our business, whatever type of agency you are, or client, really, yeah. marketing organization, you need to be able to understand whether the stuff you're doing is actually working and moving the needle forward. Yeah. So this is the age-old conversation that we've had is we spend, as an industry, millions and billions um, creating a bunch of different types of assets, campaigns, activations, experiences, but often it's hard to track ROI. Yeah. You yeah. Know, is this stuff really moving the needle forward? And so what we've invested in is setting up a set of benchmarks, a set as a framework me metrics that will allow clients and ourselves to measure the outcomes based on inputs. Right. So, you know, if you invest significant resources in elevating your digital experience, for instance, or building out your digital ecosystem, um, or launching a new app, or targeting new audiences, we should expect to see the impact of those investments captured by CCI okay. in terms of the, uh, the perceptions of the brand, perceptions of the offerings, business engagement, business growth, value added, et cetera. So that's essentially what CCI is because we believe that increasingly the work that we do in order to create and capture value needs to be strategically driven. It needs to be data informed and it needs to be linked to outcomes yeah. and not just the amount of man hours uh, or, 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 or people hours, yes. women hours that we put into the work. Um, it needs to be uh, linked to results and outcomes for our clients. Uh, and this is a big thing and, you know, kind of what drew me to finding out more about Huge when I'd, he I'd heard about this because, you know, it is a tale as old as time, really, where, you know, the client agency re relationship can kind of get... Um, in trouble when it's the hours and it's all about the hours and I'm not saying you, you know you don't track hours I'm not yeah. sure but um, but it is more output based how that evolution must have been a big shift for clients and agency and the agency yeah and it's a, it's a, it's it's and it's very true it's a great observation and, and it's a transformation that's still taking place yeah. it's not like a one and done thing um, and we do it on a client by client basis but effectively um, we need to move to a place where we are rewarded for value added um, over hours and input. Yeah. So it's more about the outcomes and it's more about the, um, the output and the, and, the, and the quality and the value of the deliverables yeah. for driving business growth than it is, you know, rate cards and timesheets and the number of people working on a project and, you know, margin management through that, through that process, which is typically how agencies have yeah. done it for a generation now. And, and I think that, you know, one of the biggest obstacles to that is often internal. Right. People are so used to doing it this way that when we try and step out of that box and do it a different way, people are like, well, they feel a little bit uncomfortable. Okay. But actually what we need to do is we recognize that the value of agencies is that we bring together a bunch of very smart people from very diverse backgrounds with incredible insights uh, to kind of swarm a client challenge or opportunity and unlock growth for them, right? And transformation and unfair advantage, we like to call it. Why not reward that based on the, the value of the outcomes um, as opposed to just like, oh, we need to pay all these people to do this yeah, work, yeah. but we'd actually know what value the work is going to bring to the business, yeah, right? Yeah. It's just kind of flipping the script on the way that we, uh, the way that we perceive and the way that we 
um, creating capture value and present that to clients. And often when you have those conversations with clients, they're, they're very open to yeah, it. You know, sometimes, sometimes there can be a sliding scale in terms of like how you know, your, your, your pricing structure is actually linked to specific outcomes. Sometimes it can be more fixed price. Uh, but I think there's, there's a degree of confidence and, there's, and, you're, and you're all aligned and focused on achieving the highest quality outcome as opposed to like, what are the inputs to get there, right? Yeah. Rewarding agencies based on inputs doesn't make sense. Rewarding agencies based on outcomes and results makes perfect sense. I, I love unfair advantage, so that's brilliant. Because <laughs> um, what client doesn't want an unfair advantage in this exactly, marketplace? Exactly. Um, but then on the, how, like on the client side, I guess, because one of the things I've seen certainly from agency and client side is, the transfer of information from the client to the agency to help them understand the impact of the outcomes. Like that must be an evolution as well because you're yeah. going to need that data, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And look, don't get me wrong. It's not, it's not always a linear process, mm. right? It's, it's a learning process. It's a completely different way of working with clients and it definitely demands a higher degree of trust, um, credibility and transparency. Because to your point, you're going to have to act access to data points that you may ne not necessarily have had in the past yeah. in order to more accurately assess the impact of the work, right? Um, and often it's the, the impact is not just based on the input from the work of the agency, right? They can look at many different factors, macroeconomic factors, competitive factors, pricing factors, distribution factors, a bunch of different other factors that could determine the, the outcome. Yeah. Um, but I do, we do, you know, we have an army of data scientists uh, some of them are, you know, well, all of them, I think, are top tier, but I was going to say some of them are like, you know, PhD level thinkers. Uh, yeah. And, and we, there, we do have the tools, if our clients are willing to collaborate with yeah. us, where we can actually build, you know, pretty sophisticated um, measurement structures and frameworks that allow us to more accurately assess the impact of the work if we have access to that data. I, I, I remember the first time I got to work with data scientists yeah. um, and I was just like, oh, Wow, this, is, <laughs> yeah. this changes the yeah. game. They make you feel real dumb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay. <laughs> I realize I just had to. I'm not the smartest person in the room <laughs> Never by a mile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I realize I just had to be able to know what question to ask. And yeah, yeah, was, exactly. That was the key. And the, which question to ask to not look dumb. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, definitely. But it, it, it is a game changer and complete. And for me, it was bringing the data scientist and, and that, that team in really early, like mm. really early, like here's what we're trying to figure out. And then they were able to kind of say, well, if we do these things, we'd be able to get a read on it. Yeah, As exactly. opposed to us going, and we did it, we were like, go and do something and then go, can we, can we analyze this? They're like, no, it's set up completely wrong. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, no, totally. You want to get them early in the process. Yeah. Um, you want to get them super early in the process. And that's why I think like, the old sort of cascading waterfall of, you know, you go from client brief to like, you know, mm. strategy and research, and then you go into design, and then you go into development and building the, the experience. Like we need to sort of break up those silos. Um, they need, we need to rethink the way that we work uh, collectively um, in a sort of unsiloed, unfettered way so that we can draw on the creativity that's coming from all of these different teams and these different like functional leaders, uh, including data science, like get them early in the process yeah. so that we can, and, and also, you know, developers and engineers so we can understand the art of the possible yeah. Yeah. as opposed to yeah. trying to figure it out on the, you yeah. know, later in the process when we've already built the thing the wrong way. Uh, and then we're sort of grappling in the dark, basically. Yeah. We go sell something and like we can't build that. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it exactly. That, that is that is not. I mean, particularly in the age of, of of intelligent experiences, where we're building something that's never been done before. Yeah, from building the types of. This is what I find really exciting about IX is, you know, we kind of understand how websites work. We sort of understand how apps work. We've seen these things for a while. Ad campaigns, obviously. Um, but there's this whole new generation of experiences that we're starting to see little sort of green shoots sprouting up, but we haven't seen the full like puzzle yet. And we're just putting together little pieces of it. You know, we're doing some work with Google where we're injecting AI and intelligence into some of their consumer facing experiences. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of other clients that we've been, you know, we've announced recently. We're doing some really interesting work with a company called Darling Ingredients. Darling Ingredients um, is, a, is a world leading company that just takes the stuff that's wasted. Okay. You know, agricultural waste, yeah, yeah. food waste, et cetera, and it turns it into usable, amazing usable products. So it's a part of the circular economy. And we used uh, their website that we just launched for them, um, used uh, uh, entirely AI generated imagery. 
Oh, wow. Where we gave them a library of entirely AI generated imagery um, that, you know, achieved incredible efficiencies in terms of their production budget, but also in exceptionally high quality imagery that spoke to the kind of the, the, their corporate positioning, you know, and particularly reflected the kind of organic natural aspect of their work. Uh, so those are a couple of examples. We're doing some work with Hublot, the watch company. You know, these are yeah. these are watches that are selling for like fifty to hundred thousand dollars, right? They're major investments, um, and there's a sort of white glove service that you expect in a luxury boutique. Yeah. How do we replicate that in the digital space where it feels very high touch? It feels very personalized. Uh, it feels very human, which typically hasn't happened when you go onto a luxury website. It still just feels like a website. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The images the might be watch. exactly yeah. the images <laughs> might be more sophisticated, um, and maybe the fonts are nicer. Yeah, yeah. But effectively, it's a website, right? So, you know, those are some of the early explorations. We haven't cracked the code yet, but we think we're probably closer than than, than most to getting there, um, and that's really going to be part of the focus of the agency going forward. It's incredible. How do you how do you kind of keep innovation and creativity and kind of that culture in your team and and i guess along with that keep focus yeah no, absolutely that and focus and accountability as well uh, is really important for 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 me and for us as a leadership team so i mean i think that you know there's an old proverb which is that people people perish for lack of vision you need to start with a vision right if you don't have a vision a north star of where you're heading and why you're heading there and what the definition of great looks like then it's very hard to drive that culture of, of innovation and engagement and creativity. I mean, that's one, something that I learned very early in my career at BBH. There was a very clear yeah. definition of what great looked like, and that greatness was expected from everybody across the board on all accounts. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to still instill at Huge. We're spending a lot of time um, socializing with the organization, like what do we think the definition of great looks like in this next generation of digital experiences and products? And what IX is, giving them a very clear understanding of what it means is yeah. more than just a, a chat bot. It's so many different things that we can explore in terms of how we build and what we build and and getting people really connected to that vision and excited about that vision. If that the vision doesn't excite you, that's fine, right? There yes. may be other companies with different yeah. visions that you find yeah. more compelling and more exciting. But if you want to be at huge, you know, this is where we think the future of our business lies. And we're seeing an incredible like um, rejuvenation of energy. Right, there's a lot of people that are super excited. We're hiring some incredible talent. We just hired a new. I was going to ask you yeah. some recent hires. Absolutely, and those are folks who are coming on board who have a very clear understanding of what we're trying to achieve with the business right now. We have a new global CCO, a new global CTO, an exec uh, creative director who's going to run our Google business. Um, these are all world class talents who've worked at incredible places and great agencies, and you know they're super excited to come to Huge to help us build this 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 future business. It's inc it's incredible, and they've yeah. just recent. I mean, announced in the last couple of days. Yeah, these abso new hires. Ab absolutely. Uh, I think our I think our CTO started three weeks ago. Our CTO our CCO started two weeks ago, um, and our new ECD on Google starts in like a week. Wow. Um, and actually, the CTO is a is a is a boomerang. He was at Huge previously. Okay. Uh, and left and did some really cool things in the crypto space and then at Valtech and now he's come back to us, which is a great sort of stamp of endorsement for, you know, great talent is, is sort of gravitating towards us and, and also coming back to us. Based on this new... Based on, based on the vision that we have. Yeah. For me, I always believe in visionary leadership. It starts with the vision. Yeah. You need to develop the strategy to execute that vision. You need the right talent in place. You need the right processes, tools and structures and you need to be able to measure success yeah. and pivot accordingly, right? Just like if you're building any product yeah. or any business, um, you can't always just you know, stay stuck in mud in your lane. Like you have to like read the market, but also know how to apply your vision in dynamic, in, you know, dynamic terrain, which is what we operate in. It's really interesting. And I, I spoke to an Irish agency recently and we talked about creativity. And um, we spoke a lot about process in that, in that, uh, in that interview and, you know, we were kind of almost joking through it going, oh my God, this is an episode about creativity and all we're doing is talking about process. But I was kind of making the point that it's actually really important, like you're saying, to have process and structure in place because almost, cre like, take creativity. I think creativity needs a process which is almost the space then to be creative. But if you can't create the process to have space to be creative, you'll never be creative. No, absolutely. I mean, look, there's a lot of people who really believe in creative chaos. Um, I think you can, I think it's like, Creativity is, you know, that old, that old sort of, I think it was Woody Allen or one of those guys who said something like, you know, 90% um, perspiration, 10% inspiration, right? You can say it's like 90% process yeah. and then 10% sort of 
chaos. But that chaos has to be like, it has to be constructive chaos, yeah. right? Otherwise it can become qu quickly um, destructive and kind of sap energy. Uh, BBH was one of the most process-oriented organizations that I ever worked at. <laughs> there was very clear, structured process. But those lanes allowed you to innovate and be creative extremely effectively because you knew what the boundaries were, so to speak. Like you might say, oh, well, the whole point of creativity is there's no boundaries. Like, yes, to a degree, yeah. but, but we're working in, in, we're not in fine art, right? Yeah, yeah. This is commercial creativity, so it's meant to achieve a business objective. So you do need the process to push the creativity towards the right objective. Yeah, yeah. So we're in, the, we're in the process of, of reimagining our, pro our processes in order to further fuel creativity, not limit it, yes. but actually accelerate yeah. it. Yeah, no, yeah. Like so I totally, I totally yeah. agree with what you and your friend were discussing. Um, the client relationships, we talked a bit about, um, but there's been longevity, I think, with a lot of the clients. Yeah. Um, you know, how, I guess, how important has that been? I mean, client relationships are, are crucial, but I think, yeah. you know, in terms of this evolution as well, like the conversations, and has it allowed Huge to maybe elevate the conversations to the C-suite, maybe CFO, because some of the stuff you're talking about, I often hear, like, you know, there's definitely things CFOs care about. Yeah. No, definitely. No, I mean, we've been very fortunate, and some of our clients, we have access to the C-suite um, as much as we need to. Yeah. And that could be CEOs, it could be CFOs. But also, we have a, a range of internal stakeholders that we work with, you know. So it's, it, it is CMOs, yeah. as you would expect, but also, you know, CIOs, Chief Innovation and Chief Information Officers, CTOs, Chief Design Officers, like the full gamut, because often the experiences that we build are either shared by the C-suite leaders or, you know, they'll fall in one or the other, um, but they typically tend to be a collaboration, right? Because they're so important yeah. to the business. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the, the, the longevity of the relationships, I, like I said, I, we've been Google, with Google for over 12 years. I feel McDonald's is like seven years. Hublot, I mentioned, I think is between five and seven years. So we do have pretty long-standing yeah. relationships, and those, and those are just a few. There's others that I can mention. Um, and some that have been with us a very long period of time uh, in the past. And a lot of that is based on everything you would expect in a great relationship, right? Maintaining the chemistry, the credibility, the trust, the transparency, and creating a sense of partnership. So you don't have that us and them thing that we talked about earlier, right? It's like, we, you know, we really are getting under the hood of their businesses. We're getting access to some of the, you know, the most critical data. Um, and we're helping them to drive growth in very tangible, measurable, and meaningful ways, right? So it's not just like, you know, brand awareness or brand affinity that you sometimes get with big ad campaigns. Yeah. We can actually see what buttons are being clicked, what businesses are being driven, what conversion rates are increasing, you know, what lifetime value is being accelerated, et cetera. So I think that we, we try to think more in terms of collaborative partnerships, you know, regular workshopping, uh, regular sprint uh, cadence, so that, you know, there's not some big aha yeah, and yeah. bail moment at the end, right? Like, we've just gone into our cave for six weeks, and now we come out with the answer to all of your problems. It's not that type of process. It's much more iterative and collaborative uh, and transparent along the way. I have a great short story of somebody who went sure. through that experience of, you know, age who went away, you know, the big ta-da moment. And the response from the person was, can I just talk about my degrees of disappointment? <laughs> <laughs> but because there's some, maybe something fundamental, not fundamentally flawed, but like, again, I don't think the client needs to be in everything, but like waiting that long yeah. and all that time potentially wasted. I love that kind of getting in and working collaboratively, but also knowing when to be in and when to be out. Do, do you know, like it's, it's, Hard yeah. to manage, isn't it? It, it is, and I'm, but I think you know those are those are those are what um, those are the definitions of great client partnership mm. leaders, right? We have a client partnership leadership team, and you know they are very skilled at understanding how to build those relationships of trust. To your point, knowing when to lean in, yeah, and maybe when when to step back, um, and and that's that's a craft. Yeah. Just, yeah, as, yeah, just as much yeah. as designing or engineering or strategy, it's a craft. It's learned over time. Um, it's 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 role modeled and there's best practices and we're continuing to to learn those and, and pass those on to our team, and they change over time. Yeah. Right, the type of relationships that you that you need to build with clients in the age of intelligent experiences and AI are going to be similar but somewhat different. Yeah. Right. You have need access to different data points. You need different skill sets. You need a different uh, tolerance for risk. Um, you need a different understanding of brand reputation. You know. You know. AI 
Gen AI still somewhat hallucinates from time yeah. to time, right? Yeah. That's, a, yeah. that's a very real thing. Right? It's not 100% accurate yeah. or reliable all the time. So it's a, there's a level of ambiguity that is different from like an ad campaign or a more traditional website build uh, that I think collectively we need to embrace and understand together. Yeah, and it, look, it's always evolving. I think the, for me, it, it's the curiosity and people wanting to learn, you know, and evolve with it, you yeah. know, because it's a great, we're in a great business to be curious. No, absolutely. This is, this is a business for, you know, curious, intelligent, hardworking, open-minded yeah. individuals. Have fun. And yeah. we are at can, obviously. What are you looking forward to this week? This is going to go out afterwards, so I should be asking, <laughs> what did you enjoy? But, but Yeah, I know. Well, you know what? This is literally the first morning. All I've had is had breakfast. I haven't had anything yet. Um, and, you know, I do look, I think there's just a bunch of the, the world's most creative, interesting, smartest people, right? Even on the plane, I met, like, an amazing guy from Microsoft. And, you know, it's like the plane was just full of, like, canned people coming from London to, to Nice. Um, and so, look, I'm just, I just want, I'm here, like, with, a, with, an, with an open mind to learn, you know? Yeah. I'm very interested in the conversations that are taking place around AI. Yeah, yeah. I think all of the big platforms um, and, and the big groups are talking about AI and its impact on the business in the future. Uh, but also other things like sustainability, DEI, you know, there's just so much going on in the business at the moment uh, that my agenda is just to learn and to meet some interesting people. That's it. I'm not, I'm not here to like, you know, hunt down clients. <laughs> I don't think that's, that stuff doesn't work. I'm not that, I'm not that guy. You're not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not that guy. I'm actually here more to learn and just to, Brilliant. and just to meet some cool people. Uh, I did want to ask you one last question. I used to go way back. You're going to wonder how many lives I've had. <laughs> I used to work in the nonprofit sector. Okay. I know you've done, are you still involved with charity? Absolutely. Charity yes. Water? I'm still on the board with charity water. Yeah. Uh, I like when I was working, it goes way back. They were kind of coming out and yeah. just, I was, amazed by uh, not only the work they were doing, but how they were communicating mm. it was phenomenal. It's an amazing organization doing amazing work. Um, what's your work on the board with them? What, what are you doing? I mean, you know, it's a typical sort of board governance role. Um, we have a you know, bunch of board meetings over the course of the year. Uh, we track the progress, we track the financials, we track the partnerships. Um, I think like any you know, good board, we're there to not to necessarily make the decisions, yeah. but to advise and to give counsel you know, key hires. Um, we also introduce uh, Charity Water to a bunch of different organizations. IPG have been a huge supporter okay. of, of, of Charity Water over the years, completely unrelated to me, you know, being at Huge. This has happened for way before I joined Huge. Um, but I think the, the two, you, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. The two things that were very interesting about Charity Water, and I've, I've known the uh, the CEO and founder, Scott Harrison, for a number of years. I'm such a fan. Is a, a great guy, is... Their embrace of technology yeah. and transparency yeah. through technology, yeah. um, which means that you could actually see what's being built with your yeah. money um, and and the investment that they made in their branding and their communications, yeah. right? Which was, I think, you know, pretty revolutionary for its time. A lot of folks have imitated, and, um, but I still think that those two factors. And then I guess there's a third piece, which is also the fact that everything that you donate goes to the field and the work, yeah, right? Yeah. That was a model that, yeah. you know, there's so many different nonprofits where a significant chunk of every dollar or pound that you give goes to like the admin costs yeah. and the overhead, which is, I like, understand, yeah, yeah. but they have a different model. Yeah. They have a whole different set of donors to support the overhead. So everything that you and I as everyday donors give that goes straight to building a well um, somewhere in the world where clean water is badly needed. It's, it, it's a, an amazing organization. And yeah. I'm, I say I'm such a huge fan of them. So I'm sure they're, they're lucky to have you on, on, on their board. Uh, I'm, 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 pr I'm, you know, I'm honored to be a part of, the, part of the team. They're great people. Listen, Judy, thank you so much for taking the time out this morning to chat no, to me. It's, it's a been pleasure. An absolute pleasure. It's a great day to start, way to start the morning. I'm very happy. It can only go up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. This is great. I really enjoyed this conversation. You asked great questions. And I love the knowledge that you have of the business from so many different angles. You know, you can tell when an interviewer knows what they're talking about because they've lived it. Yeah. So uh, this has been great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks Appreciate a million. It. Cheers. Cheers. Wow, that was phenomenal. What an amazing journey Chitty has had. I love how he's moved from creative into product, how he understands deeply the client relationship. And, you know, I see from guests who have been client side and agency side, uh, I think it has a really interesting dimension to your career when you can do both. It really helps you kind of understand the different dimensions and dynamics going on within the marketing landscape. The other part about my conversation with Chitty is the commerciality. So clear to see he gets it. And while the huge model is evolving to be output based, it requires deep commercial expertise. It was a real treat to spend time with Chitty. He was fantastically engaging 
uh, enjoyable guests. You can see we had a great time together. And thank you so much for tuning in. And look, tune in next week with our episode with Mark Ritson. It doesn't disappoint. 